Why, hello, friends. Jen Foxbot here for another edition of Math Mondays. Da 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 da. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back. In this episode, we are going to talk about power series with a focus on using infinite series to expand complex functions. And so you might be thinking, well, wait, what? That was a lot of math jargon packed in one tiny sentence. Don't worry. Basically what I mean is, and what we will work through, is taking a complex function like sine of x and using a series to uh, write sine of x in a different way. And again, we are using uh, these videos to build up to Fourier series. And at the foundation, Fourier series is taking a very complex signal and breaking it down into manageable pieces. Not necessarily easy pieces, but manageable. And in applied mathematics, a lot of the work that we do is to make our lives a little bit easier. Sometimes it's a tiny slice easier, but that's still better than dealing with something that would take you a very long time. So what is a power series? Well, very quickly to review, a geometric series is a sequence of numbers that repeats forever, more or less forever, very long time. Um, so we looked at a couple of different geometric series. We looked at a bouncing ball that had heights of one, and then it bounced up to two thirds, and then four ninths of a meter, and then eight twenty sevenths of a meter, etc. And then we looked at the general form of a geometric series, um, which had something like a r to the n, where both a and r are numbers. Um, a is a constant and r is our ratio but our ratio is also a constant. And so a power series is a sequence of numbers that depend on a variable. And since our favorite variable in mathematics is x, we'll just say that a power series is a sequence of numbers that goes on for infinity that is um, proportional to powers of x, or each term is a, a factor of a power of x. Okay, what does that look like? Well, a power series looks like this. You start at uh, the zeroth term and you go on for infinity. It's a very long time. And uh, the general form looks like a subscript n uh, times x to the nth power. And so if we were to actually write this out term by term, what we would get is a zero, because n equals zero, and x to the zero is just one. So we add our next term plus a one x one plus a two x squared and so on. And then you would get to the point of a n x to the n. And actually you would keep adding terms because n is not yet an infinity. Ugh, very long time, but that's okay. We use our ellipses to represent lots of terms in between and it just keeps going. So we can still be lazy in math while also inferring a very, very long time. Okay, so this is the general form of a power series. I'm gonna erase this one up here because it's a little redundant. Um, and so what we can actually do with a power series is we can take a function like sine of x and we can do what is called um, a Taylor series expansion, um, which is probably named after the first person or the first person that got credit that uh, did this type of expansion using a power series. And so we're going to start by assuming that we can do this and then we will show that it actually does work, which is super cool. So I'm going to erase this because I'm going to need a lot of space on my chalkboard and I'm going to write the general form of what our uh, series would look like. So we're just really going to take the general form of a power series and then we are going to find the specific coefficients uh, that will actually represent the function sine of x. Really quick caveat, uh, if you are unfamiliar with sine of x, especially how to use sine and cosine in radians rather than degrees, let me know if there are um, at least two people um, I will be happy to do a video talking about sine and cosine of x in radians, because this actually only works if we're dealing with radians. Um, pi is radians. Uh, so just really quick, uh, pi equals 
180 degrees, um, or 90 degrees is pi over 2, uh, pi is in radians. Okay, so back to our general form of the power series. So we have a 0 plus a 1x plus a 2x squared plus a 3x cubed plus a 4x fourth plus dot 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 etc. Okay, so now, now what? We have this general form and we have to start solving for these coefficients. So in uh, physics and engineering, uh, we call it applying boundary conditions because you have a real world problem with actual uh, conditions. For example, um, if you take a ball and you drop it, the ball starts at rest. So at time zero, the velocity of the ball is zero. Um, likewise, you could say that once the ball hits the ground and stops moving, the velocity of the ball at the ground at uh, time t equals t final, um, then uh, the velocity is also zero. And so those boundary conditions help us to solve for coefficients like this. But of course, we're not dealing with dropping a ball this time, we're dealing with sine of x. So we just apply uh, the conditions that we know sine of x has to meet. And we also want to try and get rid of as many terms as possible, ideally all of them if we can, because, let's be real, we don't have an infinite amount of time to solve each of these coefficients. So if we can knock them out, basically if we can make these coefficients go to zero, then we are more likely to be able to solve for uh, specific coefficients and find a pattern that we can then use to uh, project forward. So. Hopefully, as I've been talking, you've been thinking, well, how do we get rid of all of these terms with an x in it? Well, let's pick our boundary condition of x equals 0. It also happens to be very nice for sine of x, because when x equals 0, sine of 0 equals 0. Easy peasy. So all of these terms go to 0, and you get a 0 equals 0, because if all you're left with is a 0, then you must, like, then a0 must fulfill this condition. So we say that that goes to zero. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, right? First coefficient, no problem. Okay, now what? <laughs> we only have one out of an infinity number of coefficients. No problem, right? Well, actually, it's really not too bad. All we do is we take the derivative and we keep applying the same boundary condition. So the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this f of x to keep track of what uh, derivative we are on. So now we want uh, f prime number 1 prime of x equals cosine of x, and we are going to get, remember, a 0. Even if it was a number, it would just go 0 because it's a constant. So the derivative of the right side is going to be a 1 plus a, oops, plus 2a2x plus 3a3x squared plus 4a4x cubed plus da, 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 da. And now we want all of these x's to go to zero again. So we say, okay, we'll let x equals zero. Cosine of zero equals one. So then one equals a one. Oh, look at that. These coefficients are dropping super quick. Um, and we do the same thing again. We take the second derivative, f double prime of x equals the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. And we take the second derivative of the right side, um, or I guess you could just say take another derivative of the right side with respect to x. Um, all the constants go to zero, so you get uh, 2a2 plus 3 times 2a3x plus 4 times 3a4x cubed, so use x squared, plus dot 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 dot. Okay, and again, we apply our same condition, x equals zero, uh, the uh, left side goes to zero, and so we have... Um, all of these terms go to zero, so now we know that 2a2 must also equal zero. Oh, look at that! Okay, okay. 
So that's interesting. Um, a0 and A2 um, went to 0. So we're going to do it again. So F triple prime of X, or this is the third derivative that we're taking. The derivative of sine of X is cosine, but we have this minus sign here. So we will bring that along. Cosine of X and oops, my chalk broke. Oh, so sad. Um, okay, so now we take the derivative of the right side. This term goes to zero because the derivative of a constant is zero. And we get three times two a three um, plus four times three times two a four x, just x plus dot 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 dot. Okay, and the last condition I'll apply um, cosine of zero equals one, but we have a negative on both sides because of this negative here. And so now we get um, that goes away. So 3 times 2, a 3. And I'm kind of out of space, so um, I'm going to, well, okay. Uh, but basically, you're going to get this, and what you'll find is, can I write it here? Yeah, okay. Um, a 3 equals negative 1 divided by 3 times 2. And you're like, well, why don't you just multiply these together? Isn't that just 6? Yeah, exactly. But if we do this one more time, I'm going to erase this and hopefully I'll have enough space. So we'll do this one more time and then hopefully the pattern will become clear. So uh, F, the fourth derivative with respect to X, um, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And so actually, huh, look at that, we've come full circle. So sine of X equals, uh, this goes away. Um, and we are left with 4 times 3 times 2, a 4, plus um, there will still be an infinite number of terms, but these all have x's. Um, and so we apply our boundary condition, 0 equals 4 times 3 times 2, a 4. So a 4 also goes to 0. Hmm, interesting. And actually, if we were to do it one more time, um, what we would find, I'm going to erase this now, what we would find is that the fifth derivative with respect to x is going to give us a cosine of x, and even though I didn't write it out, um, I've had to do this many a time, and it's in textbooks and such. So what you get is uh, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, a 5, Plus, these are going to be terms with higher x. And remember, um, the subscript originally corresponds uh, to the power of x that it is next to. So in this original equation, this would have been um, plus a 5x to the fifth. So now this term, the fifth derivative later, looks like this. And so you find, oh, look at that. a5 has to equal uh, cosine of 0 is 1. And so a5 equals 1, a positive 1, over 5 factorial. 5 times 3 times 2 times 1 uh, is also 5 factorial. Very cool. We have a pattern. Look at that. And you could keep doing this many, many, many more times, and you are going to find that this pattern holds. And so what you get is that the uh, Taylor series expansion of sine of x looks like, let me grab my notes because I definitely don't have this memorized, um, it looks like x minus um, x to the cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial plus etc etc. Pretty cool, right? So this is sine of x written in a power series format. Look at that. You can also do the same thing for cosine. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that right here. Uh, I would challenge you to do it on your own. You do the same exact thing. You start with the generic power series formula. You apply the boundary condition of at x equals zero, and then you solve for the coefficients one by one. And what you should find, if it's done correctly, lots of mathematicians have done this before myself. Um, and so the power series or the Taylor series expansion um, of a power series for cosine of x 
is 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial plus etc etc. Red. Oh wow, I write pretty crooked. Um, okay, so all of this is to say that we can use an infinite series to represent different functions. And at the heart of it, that is what a Fourier series is doing. So a Fourier series is very similar to this method in that it allows us to write a complex function in bite-sized pieces. And what is very interesting about this, if you were to pick a value for x in radians, again, remember we must use radians, we would find that even if we didn't include all infinite terms, we can use pieces of this to estimate a value for sine. And this is actually really useful because remember, calculators are a new thing. So mathematicians back in the day had to have these tables of values for sine and cosine and or memorize them. The really serious mathematicians probably did them so many times that they did have them memorized. But let's say someone needed to figure out sine of 27.425. Um, I'm not actually going to do this because no thank you. Um, but uh, this Taylor series expansion would be a much, much, much easier way to calculate this value uh, than it would to do it by hand um, with a right triangle or something. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so uh, these expansions can be really useful because it allows us to uh, make calculations uh, without having to uh, work with a potentially complex function. Okay, so I know that that was a lot. Um, don't worry, if it was a little confusing, you can always watch it again. Uh, definitely try the cosine power series for your own, and then you'll start to understand how this works. And the other thing that I would recommend that you do is take a couple of simple examples. Um, so what is sine of pi? And calculate both sides. You can use a calculator for this, no problem. Use the tools at our disposal, that's totally fine. And find, uh, okay, what happens? I'll put a question mark there, pi minus pi cubed over three factorial plus pi to the fifth over five factorial. Um, I would say stick with the first three terms and see, compare the two. Compare the two answers and see how different they are. And then you can, uh, you can use that to figure out, oh, okay, the more terms that I add, the more accurate it gets. But at a certain point, uh, the more terms you add, it doesn't really increase um, accuracy all that much. Cool. So let me know if you have any questions about power series or Taylor series expansion. Um, and hopefully next video, uh, I need to mention uh, Euler's formula. That's really important. But other than that, we are pretty close to being able to do Fourier series. Uh, one thing that I have covered in previous videos that I haven't uh, talked about a lot here are complex numbers. So go ahead and uh, watch the Algebra 2 video on complex numbers if you're curious about that. If you have remaining questions, let me know. And again, uh, I have not yet covered sine and cosine. Those are things that are talked about a lot in trigonometry, so I opted to skip them. But again, with any of these things, if I get two or more people asking for questions, I am more than happy to... Um, to cover those topics. Cool. So let me know if you have any questions about this or other math topics and we will tackle it together. All right. Thanks very much for watching and we will see you next time. Bye.